Hello, this is Torias Radiology and my name is Lee. Today we are going to talk about descending transcentorial herniations, especially about uncle herniations. And this is the third part of our series of lectures about brain herniations. In this lecture, we are going to talk about the anatomy, and it is the hard part of this class to understand the anatomy of this region. And that's why I made a lot of animations to make it easier for you to understand the anatomy. So let's go there. DTH are the second most common type of cerebral hernia. And to understand the descending transtentorial herniations, we have to know what is the tentorian. And the cerebellar tentorian is this structure here, attached in the posterior part to the folk cerebri, and that have this knot in the anterior part. So in this knot, we have the brainstem going all the way through this tentorian. So if you trace a line, all of the things that are above the tentorium will be called supratentorial structures and the stuff that are below the tentorium will be called infratentorial structures and now we're going to see these structures in the MRI. To know the cerebellar tentorium, we're gonna trace firstly the folk cerebri, highlighted in yellow, and now we're gonna trace the cerebellar tentorium that is attached in the folks in the more posterior slides. So we're going to go interiorly now to see what's happening. That's the tentorium attached to the folks and now there's no more folks and the tentorium is open. So that's a notch. You can see here the brain stem passing all the way down and the notch. So the descending transcentorial hernia is divided in central and lateral DTH. The lateral DTH can be subdivided in anterior and posterior. So we're going to talk about each of these herniations, but firstly, we're gonna introduce the central one. So the central DTH is when all of these structures here go and the central part and pass all the way down through the tentorium. And these structures that will pass uh, all the way down uh, through this tentorium will be the diencephalon, highlighted in blue, that goes all the way down, the midbrain that goes all the way down, and this superior part of the bones that is supratentorium that goes all the way down. Here you can see the causes of brain herniations, the central descending transcentorial brain herniations. That, uh, the first one will be bilateral supratentorial disease that creates these vectors and the resulting vector highlighted here. You can see midline masses, you can see severe brain edema, and also supratentorial hydrocephalus. Now we're going to talk about the lateral DTH and more specifically about the anterior part. The uncus will be represented the anterior lateral DTH and the parahypocampal gyrus will be responsible for the posterior one. So the cause of this lateral DTH will be unilateral supratentorial disease. Here you can see in this video highlighted in blue the uncus. We're going to see now this structure here, highlighted in blue, is a third cranial nerve arising from the anterior part of the pons. So the uncus here, if it get, uh, gets bigger here, it will compress and herniate through this nerve here that is a third cranial nerve. But if you see, the parahypocampal gyrus is too posterior, so it will not compress directly uh, this this uh, third cranial nerve. So you can have a posterior lateral transcentorial descending transcentorial herniation without compression of the third cranial nerve. So here you can see that nerve arising from the posterior part of the pons here, that is the trochlear nerve, the fourth cranial nerve. It can be compressed as well. And now you can see that structure here, now highlighted in blue, that is a PCA. And the PCA, posterior cerebral artery, 
that arises from the basilar artery that gives its ramus that you can see here that are the pontin arteries. We have one another structure to study here that's the anterior choroidal arteries that is highlighted in green. So we're going to review all of the structures zoomed in in this uh, figure right now. That is the posterior cerebral artery. That is the third cranial nerve. That is the perforating branches from basilar artery. That is the anterior choroidal artery. And I'm going to draw now the fourth cranial nerve. And now we are going to talk about uh, the complications because of the compressions of these structures. The compression of the PCA will lead to an ischemic stroke in this area of the PCA. The compression of the perforating branches will lead to an endurous hemorrhage. We're going to talk about that later. And the compression of the anterior choroidal artery will lead to an infarct. And the patient will present with hemiplegia, hemianesthesia, and contralateral hemianopsia. And the compression of the nerves will lead to a fourth cranial nerve palsy and the third cranial nerve palsy as well. And the first symptom of this patient will be midriasis. So pay attention now, please. We are going to talk about the most important thing in this lecture. So, the earliest finding in uncle herniation is the effacement of the supracellular cistern. I'm going to call somebody to give an advice to you. Look at the stars, look how they shine for you. What the meaning of that phrase? So, the stars here represent the supracellular cistern. But I have to say to you that the star is not like that. It's more like a David stars, a six point stars. The importance here is the supracellular cistern or the star will be effaced by the uncle herniation. We're going to study that anatomy. Now we're going to draw the star. That's a, a symmetrical six point star, it's not like the David stars. This star will shine for you in every normal patient. You have to find, you have to look for the shining star. Okay, look how they shine for you. I have here another normal patient. I have a six point star. That's a supercellular cistern. Look how they shine for you. Now, I have another patient here. There is an effacement of the supercellular cistern because of the compression by the uncus. That star is not shining for you. That's not a normal patient. They have a herniation of the uncus. Now, we are going to study the anatomy of DTH on MRI. This is the uncus. This is the hippocampal gyrus. Now we're going to see the cisterns. The cistern here between the cerebral peduncles will be the interpeduncular cistern. This is the crural cistern. This is the perimesencephalic cistern. This is the quadrigeminal cistern. This is the cerebral aqueduct that leads the CSF from the third ventricle to the fourth ventricle and this is the PCA. When the uncus enlarges, it will compress firstly the crural cistern here in the basal cisterns. So there will be a compression of the crural cistern of the brainstem here, then a compression of the interpendicular cistern and all of the things that we studied the passes here the third cranial nerve, the fourth cranial nerve, the PCA, the anterior choroidal artery. And so uh, when there is this compression, you can see that there will be more space to this cistern here, the perimesencephalic cistern, to enlarge. Okay, we can see that in the CT scans. There is a compression of the uncus here in the cerebral peduncle the facement of the crural cistern on that side 
an enlargement of the perimesencephalic system on that side. In the other side, you can see the effacement of the cisterns, basal cisterns on the other side, and there is an enlargement of the temporal pole of the lateral ventricle on the right side. Here, you can see when the uncus enlarges, there will be a complete effacement of the crural cistern, a effacement of the perimesencephalic cistern, and a compression of the brainstem with rotation of the axis of the brainstem. There will be also a compression of the cerebral aqueduct that will lead to hydrocephalus and the compression of the quadrigeminal cisterns with the compression of the superior tactile plate that leads to the Parhineus syndrome. Remember, the anterior lateral DTH will be commonly first than the posterior one. Now we're going to talk about the posterior that the parahypocampal gyrus is responsible for. The parahypocampal gyrus will compress firstly the perimesencephalic cistern and not the crural cistern. You can see that the third cranial nerve will arise in the interior part of the bones so it will not get compressed by the parahypocampal gyrus in the initial phase. So there will be also a rotation of the axis and a compression of the quadrigeminal cistern and the cerebral aqueduct as well. On the next lecture, we're going to open the Dictionary of Medical Eponyms of Brain Herniations. We're going to meet Duhe, Pahinu, and Canahan. And remember the advice, don't forget to look at the stars of your patients. So if you like the video, give a thumbs up and subscribe to our YouTube channel.